This is the final uh, section where we will put to use a lot of the information that I've gone over in the prior sections uh, about how to actually observe the patients uh, joint by joint uh, with some further understanding and further comments uh, about both the kinematics, that is the way the joints move, and the uh, muscles and biomechanics that uh, are involved in that motion. So as I said before, uh, you're going to analyze gait in a very systematic way. And by visual observation, you can learn a tremendous amount about patient's gait and use it for decision making as well as outcome analysis. And you just have to be a careful observer. And if you were casually driving by this spot, you might miss uh, these two uh, sitting there because they blend so uh, nicely into their environment but they might not miss you. And they certainly wouldn't miss this uh, herd uh, because this means their potential dinner uh, for the next couple days. Uh, and if these animals start moving, the prey that is, uh, they would carefully observe their gait because if they saw any abnormal gait, uh, that might make for a much easier uh, animal to catch and they would be off in an instant which actually is what happened. Uh, in this final section, we're going to look at the motion at each joint uh, from the top down, first in the sagittal plane in section A, and then in the coronal and uh, axial plane in section 6B. First, we'll look at the hip and pelvis. Now, the pelvis is actually difficult to see uh, in terms of its movement. Um, and there isn't much movement. But you can gain some insights into pelvic position uh, by looking at the posture, particularly the lumbar spine. Because if you see the lumbar spine in lordosis, uh, this probably means the pelvis is in an anterior tilted position. Whereas if the lumbar spine is flattened, this coincides with posterior tilt. So if we look at how the hip joint moves, uh, it's the simplest uh, of all the joints because it's just flexion extension. So that as the gait cycle is initiated at the initial foot strike here, the hip is in maximum flexion. And then through stance phase, the hip extends fully and then flexes again through swing phase. So it's basically extension, which powers the hip extensors to move the center of mass forward, followed by flexion to preposition the leg to accept weight for the next step to continue to power the trunk forward. And here it is graphically represented. You can see at the beginning of the gait cycle at foot strike, uh, the hip is in maximum flexion and progresses to maximum extension until it flexes through swing phase. So this is the graphic representation of what you're seeing visually. And uh, you can actually, if you have a gait lab or look at gait lab studies, see the actual uh, degrees of flexion extension. So you start uh, stance phase and maximum flexion you progress to maximum extension at the end of stance phase and then flex through swing phase so that you can begin the next gait cycle. So that's the hip. Uh, the hip is powered by the hip extensor muscles, which are the gluteus maximus and the hamstrings, which act as accessory extensors when they work concentrically. Uh, to extend the hip to bring the center of mass forward. The gluteus maximus basically never works eccentrically. The hamstrings do work eccentrically some during swing phase, which we'll discuss uh, when we talk about the knee. So that's the hip motion. So when you observe the patient, that's the first thing you look at, the hip. Then will progress down to the knee. And the motion at the knee 
is a bit more complex. It's not just simple flexion extension. Um, and you'll see here on the skeleton that uh, at the beginning at foot strike, the knee's in full extension, but then it flexes a bit uh, through initial loading period and then fully extends through mid to late stance until the toe comes off the ground and then it flexes through swing phase. And that's shown graphically here that you land in relatively full extension, but then you go into some knee flexion as you load the limb. This serves as sort of a shock absorber uh, to the internal knee structures because if you landed in full extension, that would create a lot more impact loading on the cartilage and the menisci. And also it serves to dampen some of the oscillation of the pelvis up and down, that is the pelvic up and down motion, which helps to conserve energy. But then you extend fully through mid to late stance until swing phase when you begin to flex again. Now it may be surprising to many people that actually the quadriceps, which are hip extensors, is not terribly active in stance phase. And indeed, if you landed with your knee in full extension, you wouldn't need your quadriceps at all. But the quadriceps functions to help support the knee during that initial wave of knee flexion. But then you can see between mid and light stance, the quadriceps totally turns off and really does not help to support the knee during stance phase. What keeps the knee in extension during stance phase is the ground reaction force of the ankle, which is stabilized by the gastroxoleus, which prevents excessive dorsiflexion in stance and helps to maintain the knee in full extension. So in addition to looking at the knee in stance, we also want to look at the knee in swing. And the normal knee flexion in swing is 60 degrees, which is necessary in order for the foot to clear the ground. There are certain situations, uh, such as patients with cerebral palsy, uh, where the rectus femoris uh, is active during the entire swing phase and thereby inhibits the normal flexion of the knee uh, which causes a stiff knee gait and adaptations must be done to achieve foot clearance. The way the knee flexes is actually not through concentric activity of the hamstrings, but actually eccentric activity, which maintain a certain level of tone in the hamstring. So as the hip flexes, the hamstrings act as a tether, which causes knee flexion as the hip flexes uh, to allow this flexion wave in swing phase. And there it is graphically, uh, the knee flexion in swing phase. Finally, the ankle, which is the most complex of all the joints because you have some plantar flexion at loading, dorsiflexion through stance, followed by plantar flexion at toe off, followed by dorsiflexion through swing. I went through that rather quickly because I'm going to go back through it again in uh, more detail uh, because the motions of the ankle are referred to as the ankle rockers, that is the motions of the ankle during stance phase. And so we have three ankle rockers, each one defined by the phase of gait and by the motion that occurs during that point. So the first one is with loading. Uh, since you load on your calcaneal tuberosity, but the ankle joint is located anterior to this, as you load, the foot is passively going to be pushed into plantar flexion. And we don't want the foot to slap on the floor uh, so that the tibialis anterior works during this portion of the gait cycle in an eccentric fashion, so it's being stretched while it's contracting to modulate this plantar flexion, which is induced uh, through the biomechanics of the leg as it's loaded.
So once that occurs, then the foot is flat, and then we begin second rocker, which extends through stance phase. And second rocker is interpreted as dorsiflexion of the foot, but it's not actually moving the foot into dorsiflexion. It's the tibia advancing forward on the planted foot. But if you measure the angle of the tibia with the foot, uh, you would see that, that there is dorsiflexion occurring. And this is controlled by the strong eccentric contraction of the gastroc soleus. And if the gastroc soleus is weak, then the tibia can advance excessively forward and you end up with a crouch type situation where the quadriceps has to work excessively hard in order to keep the knee from collapsing. This creates fatigue in the quadriceps. It creates excessive patellofemoral forces. And in addition, the patellar tendon becomes stretched out and you end up with patella alta. So this is a situation which may occur naturally, but more often occurs because of lengthening of the Achilles tendon or portions of the gastroc soleus complex. So it's much better to have the gastroc soleus a little tight and have your knee stable than it is to have a weakened gastroc soleus and end up in this crouch position, which creates a situation which is very difficult to deal with. As you progress to the end of stance phase and the body weight is forward, the other leg is beginning to be loaded. You begin to plantar flex to launch the foot forward into swing phase. And the gastroc soleus, which has been working eccentrically to resist dorsiflexion, now starts shortening as it's contracting. So it actually then begins plantar flexing and working concentrically uh, to launch the leg forward into swing phase. So those are the three rockers of the ankle during stance phase. Now, after stance phase, of course, we go into swing phase. And during swing phase, uh, the limb advances forward. The foot goes into dorsiflexion uh, in order to achieve foot clearance. And this is by the concentric contraction of the tibialis anterior, a relatively weak muscle, but it doesn't have much to do because the foot's not very heavy, so all it has to do is lift the foot up, unless there's strong co-contraction of the gastroc soleus or contracture of the gastroc soleus that it has to fight against, and then you may have plantar flexion during swing phase, which is considered a drop foot gait. So there you can see the uh, dorsiflexion that occurs after toe off uh, and is maintained at zero degrees during swing phase. So that's the end of the sagittal plane. So now let's look at the skeleton as if we were looking at a patient. And you can look at it from the foot and ankle to the knee to the hip or from the hip down. But in any case, do it in a systematic fashion. Let's look at it from the hip first, where we can see the hip extending during stance phase. There we go, the beginning of the gait cycle. And the hip is going from full flexion to full extension. And then after toe off, the hip flexes again to preposition to accept weight for the next step. And this is what you're going to do with the patient. You're going to look at each leg separately, each joint separately. So now let's look at the knee. And the knee lands in extension, goes into some flexion. And then as the trunk advances with the uh, stable foot planted on the ground, the femur moves forward on the tibia and the knee achieves full extension. See that? Full extension in mid to late stance. And finally, look down at the ankle. You see first rocker when the calcaneus is loaded, second rocker as the body weight advances forward, third rocker plantar flexion at push off, and then dorsiflexion through swing uh, to achieve foot clearance.
and that's the sagittal plane and that's how you're going to do gait analysis in your patients. So here it is with the muscles uh, once again and you can see that they work in a very uh, orchestrated fashion turning on and off uh, at precisely the right time. And the problem in patients with cerebral palsy is that this nice phasic control doesn't happen, that uh, muscles tend to prolong uh, their period of activity, they're dysphasic, so that the normal motion that you expect to happen at each joint is impaired and you have abnormal motions and adaptations to deal with these. So finally, here is a subject, and we'll again just go through the sequence, looking at his hip motion. So there's foot strike, his hip fully extends, and then flexes through swing phase. Next, we'll look at his knee with foot strike. The knee's in full extension, flexes, goes into full extension in mid to late stance, and then flexes again through swing. And finally, the foot and ankle lands on the heel. The foot plantar flexes, dorsiflexes through stance, plantar flexes at push-off, and then dorsiflexes for clearance through swing. So that's precisely what you can do with the patient. And in subsequent uh, postings, I will, uh, in, I will have some patient examples so you can see how you can use this skill to analyze the abnormalities that a patient may have in gait and then come to some uh, conclusions about interventions which you could use to correct those abnormalities or at least make them less severe. So we'll move into the next section which is the coronal and axial planes.